Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. If we could uh, begin our meeting. Thank you so much to each one of you for uh, coming here today to join the Be Well quarterly meeting. Uh, my name is Rick Afable, and I am the chair of the board of MindOC and Be Well Orange County. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. So um, give yourself a round of applause for being here and for all of us to be here. It always warms my heart when I see so many people who have come together. And then someone told me it was because of the Mendocino Farms lunch that that's why everybody showed up. And uh, by the way, thank you to whoever provided that lunch. It was really good. Um, I wanted to uh, provide a little bit of background uh, for some of you who might be new to the Be Well Coalition. I've seen some new people and some new faces here uh, and a good reminder to uh, all of us as we are together as to uh, what we're doing and why we are here. Um, so I made a few notes to myself. Um, the vision of Be Well Orange County, which has been around now for five plus years, and we've been working together. Our vision is that we will lead the nation in optimal mental, Orange County will lead the nation in optimal mental health and wellness for all residents. And I underline all residents. That's our vision. Thank you for that. Um, so the question, of course, is, so we all have that aspiration. We've been working together, um, the hundreds, if not thousands of us who have been working to do just what that vision statement says. Um, and the question, then, of course, is, well, how are we, how are we going to do that? How do we do that? And so we've been working hard now, all of us, for the last five years in just that very task, which is um, leading the nation and creating optimal wellness for all residents of our community. Um, the specific how is that we are building an integrated world, world class system of mental health care for our community. Nice music. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> We're building an integrated world class system of mental health care. Um, a big and important way in which we are doing that is that we are weaving together the fabric of a world-class system of care. In order for that weaving to occur, there have been some very good things that, that we as a community have been doing in the area of mental illness and substance use disorder and the care of individuals affected by those two conditions and many, many other elements that affect mental health. Um, and, and then there have been gaps, and we identified those gaps. And so weave together what we have, fill the gaps that exist for those areas that need attention and that we don't have incumbent, if you will, incumbent um, elements within Orange County. Um, and sometimes we get them from the outside, sometimes we create them net brand new. Many of you will recall a, um, um, a tweet that we had in the summer of, uh, Karen, help me, 2018, 2018, in which um, a good number, about this number of individuals, and many of you were there. Um, we spent two days um, in San Juan Capistrano and put together a blueprint. And I want to recall for you and make you familiar again with that blueprint. By the way, if any of you need more information about the mission, the vision, um, the blueprint, it's all on the be well OC website. It's all on the website. So I, I refer you there. And you'll recall that the blueprint had six result areas. And we're going to get an update on the six result areas today. We're going to focus on a few of them more than others, but all of the six result areas um, will be touched today and we will give updates on um, the work that you all, that we all have been doing for these past five, six years in building that integrated world-class mental health care system that then will lead us to be uh, leading the nation in optimal mental health and wellness for all residents. Uh, one of the areas that I wanted to touch upon, because it's not in the blueprint specifically, is the area of governance. Um, so as I mentioned, I am the chair of the board of Mind OC. And so I want to introduce Mind OC to some of you who may not be familiar. Uh, Mind OC is a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation 
that was created in order to provide infrastructure for the work of the coalition, for all of us together. So we as a coalition, we need some structure, do we not? We need to be able to have structure so that we can do things, so that we can build a facility in Orange, so that we can own vans and we can hire people and we can do the kinds of things that we're all doing together, filling those gaps, and then also empowering those elements that already exist within the mental health system, uh, mental health care system here in Orange County. So MindOC is that 501c3 corporation. It has a structure. Uh, and it has a board. There are eight members of that board. By the way, I refer you again to the Be Well OC website. If you look down in the bottom of the website, there's a uh, link to the Mind OC webpage and website. So Mind OC has a website now. So the organization that I chair, Mind OC, whose sole purpose, sole purpose of that 501c3 corporation is to support the needs of Be Well Orange County to support that vision and the mission of Orange County. That's the only thing that MindOC does. There are eight board members there. Again, I refer you to the website. One of the board members are here, Steve Pittman, is the um, uh, president of um, NAMI Orange County. Round of applause for Steve. And, and the, the board members represent um, the hospital community, they represent um, the public uh, community, the public side of, of, of our work. Uh, they represent um, in an advisory uh, format. Um, they represent the academic community. They also represent the faith community. So we have all members of this public-private partnership as we move forward in, in creating that integrated world-class mental health system. Okay, so um, just a reminder for some of you who had heard all this before of how we are going about the work of um, Be Well Orange County. We're going to hear a lot more about that today. And um, uh, really, I'm, again, very grateful for all of your time and all of your efforts uh, in uh, the work that you are conducting as members of this coalition. So with that, I want to introduce uh, Brandon Sultes, who's our program director with Be Well Orange County. He's going to go over the agenda today, and let's go ahead and get started. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Fable. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. My name is Brandon Soltis. I'm a program manager with MindOC. Um, and in a minute, I'm going to introduce up a sound and energy healer and meditation mindfulness coach. Um, just add a little bit of a restful moment here afternoon. After we feed you, hopefully you don't completely fall asleep. Um, so after Hanata, our colleague, comes up, we're going to hear from Vitka Eisen, the CEO of Health Right 360, um, as our keynote presentation. Then we'll hear from several of our Be Well representatives um, regarding Result Area 6, um, like Dr. Falbe just mentioned. We'll have a quick event announcement, and we're actually going to finish up with a hands-on um, activity um, having to do with our behavioral health systems transformation initiative. Um, and we'll have a roundtable discussion to finish off the day. And we do invite you at the end of today's meeting to please take a feedback survey. We want to continue improving these meetings for all of you. Um, so at the very end of the presentation, we'll have a QR code that you can scan and take a survey that will take 30 seconds to complete. All right, well, without much further ado, I will invite up Hanata, who again is a sound and energy healer and also a mindfulness coach. Um, so she is going to walk us through a meditation moment this morning. Like Brandon said, this is going to be a nice way to, after lunch, settle into our bodies. And my intention really is to put you in a mind state that is going to allow you to receive the information in the meeting 
from the most uh, beautiful place possible, from the place that you access your creativity, uh, from a place that you allow what you're going to hear today and the people you're going to see today to inspire you in your work. In, in the way that you're all, we are all collaborating to make that vision possible. Um, it is a very high stake, uh, that vision, right, to achieve that. And so when we come together, especially in person like this, we have an opportunity to ignite that fire and be re-inspired in what we are doing. So I'm going to use some sound healing. Um, and I'm going to guide you through a simple meditation to create that mind state. So I'm going to ask you to the best of your ability to really bring your attention and to truly listen to the sounds, to my voice, so we can all create a state of coherence here together. I'm going to use some techniques from the Heart Math Institute that creates heart coherence that allows the heart to communicate with the brain in a much more optimum state, that allows for us to access that deep wisdom and creativity that we all have. So I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes for a second, just to facilitate that process of listening deeply. The sound waves travel through the water in your body. So with your intention, open your body to receiving the frequencies. Start noticing the movement that your breath is creating in your body in this moment. You can pick one spot like your chest or your belly. And continue that deep listening by observing the silence of the breath. Start noticing the parts of your body that are touching the chair. Bringing as much of your attention to those areas, to the edges of your body as possible. Allow your whole attention, awareness to inhabit your body. We're going to take a few deeper breaths together to oxygenate the body and release the stagnation. So empty your lungs and take a deeper breath in through the nose, out through the nose. Continue this deep breathing in your own pace, honoring your body exactly where it is right in this second.
See if you can fill up your lungs a little bit more when you feel like your breath is full. And empty your lungs a little bit more when you feel like you are on the bottom of your exhales. Shift your attention to your heart space. And you're going to continue breathing a little deeper and fuller than usual. In and out of that heart or chest area. Find a rhythm that feels comfortable to you. Creating this rhythmic breathing in and out of your heart space. Continue this rhythmic breathing and connect to a sense of gratitude. Allowing that feeling or attitude to expand. Allow it to expand so it reaches the edges of your body and infuses the entire room, touching everyone here. On your next breath, take a very deep inhale. And let's breathe out through the mouth with a sigh. Let's do that two more times. Deep inhale through the nose. Open the mouth, exhale, let it out. And one more time, deep inhale, open your mouth, release. Connect to the purpose, the why that first inspired you to be a part of this coalition. Bring to your mind's eyes the person that perhaps could have used this work that we are doing together. And the lives that you are most passionate about impacting. And open your heart just with your intention of contributing everything you have, your gifts, your presence, your resources to this collaboration, to this vision.
be open to receiving also the collaboration that you need from the people in this room and beyond to do your work, to reach the people that you care about. Gently bring your attention back to the room. Keeping this openness in the heart and the mind and this connection flowing and happening. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful meeting today. Wow, that is a, how's everybody feeling? Are you feeling good? Okay, well, hi everybody, I'm Karen Lincolns and I'm with MindOC Be Well. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our um, keynote speaker today, Vitka Eisen, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of HealthRight360, which is a healthcare provider for very low income and otherwise marginalized Californians. And I'm very happy to announce, for those of you who don't know, HealthRight360 will be the new um, uh, substance use provider at the Orange Campus. So we're very excited about that. Uh, with over 30 years of experience in human services, Vika has dedicated her career to supporting people in communities struggling with addiction and incarceration through the provision of integrated, compassionate, and relevant care. Since being appointed to her current role in 2010, Vitka has led HealthRight360 through a series of mergers, growing the organization to serve over 30,000 people annually. And Vitka, I think I met you like in early in the early 2000s when um, when you were at Walden House. So yeah, um, a, a, a frequent speaker on innovative practices. Vitka is the secretary and treasurer of the board of directors of the National Council for Behavioral, Be Behavioral Health the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the California Association of Drug and Alcohol Program Executives, and the former President and Member of the Board of Directors of the California Council of Community Behavioral Health Agencies. Vicka earned her MSW from San Francisco State University and a doctorate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, and she's a former uh, injection heroin user and participated in substance use disorder treatment over 30 years ago at the agency at the agency she now leads. So with no further ado, I want to Thank you. Hey everybody. It's nice to see you. How do we make this move? Okay. I think I got it. Um, nice to see you. Nice. I'm so glad to be here, and I am really glad to, uh, to be coming to the county to offer, uh, our organization is glad to be coming here to offer substance use treatment services. Um, we've been in the county uh, for a while. We actually operate a, treat a small treatment program for women and kids on the Tustin Family Campus, and it's actually funded by uh, Child Welfare. And so it's for women who might otherwise um, lose custody of their kids. Uh, because of uh, their drug use. And so we've been doing that work for a long time. So super excited uh, to be able to expand the services here. Um, let's see. If somebody could tell me, like, when I've gone for about 20 minutes, um, I was going to put my phone on, but it would be distracting when, because it barks when I put the timer on. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I won't do that, but if you're just going to give me a wave, Karen, that'd be great. Um, so as you, as you heard, um, I'm a person with lived experience. Um, which makes me an expert on myself. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I, if, I, if to the degree that I can claim expertise, 
Uh, it is um, because I've been open to learning from some people in this room that I have known for a long time, uh, learning from uh, the people that we serve, uh, learning from research, um, and just really being always uh, questioning the work that we do and how we do it. Like I'm never satisfied that we couldn't be doing things differently or better. And I have to say, I was that way as a client way back in Walden House. I was probably pretty obnoxious, um, I would imagine. But like, I, I think I challenge us to always question what we're doing um, and, and to see if we can, what we can build on, what needs to change and what we can do better. And I think we approach the, the caring for people who use drugs. Even the title, by the way, is intentional. Because uh, I really want to think about the work, I want us to think about the work that we do as about caring for people who use drugs. And that means that sometimes those people are in treatment and sometimes they're not. Um, and, but we need to create a system that provides care for them so that they don't have bad outcomes. Like my shirt says, dead people don't recover. This has been a particularly difficult week. Um, a close colleague lost a sister to a drug overdose. Uh, on Tuesday, and we lost a client who was in outpatient programs, uh, in one of our outpatient programs, to an overdose yesterday. And so these are incredibly salient and real and pressing issues for all of us. Uh, a little bit of background about Health Right 360. So we are an integrated care organization, which means that to the degree possible, we try to build services around the people we care for, and we care for low-income Californians, typically who struggle with substance use. Um, and we have added services over the years to the degree that we could in any county where we were operating that we thought would be helpful in building health. Uh, so that has concluded in some counties, uh, street crisis response, uh, incorporated harm reduction services, community um, integration and engagement programs, uh, social support systems. We added a dental clinic. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, to our primary care, we have an FQHC in San Francisco. We have MAT programs up and down the state. So yeah, this is a Health Right 360 serves mostly low income, very low income people have forever. So I wanted to. I really focus my remarks on caring for the population of folks who are low-income Californians who struggle with substance use disorder. So what that often means for them is that the people we care for have, do not have safe or stable housing. Uh, and that is, of course, an exacerbating factor for everything else that happens, right? Um, and so um, in many of our programs, the majority of clients we serve are, hom are homeless and not sheltered. So they're rough sleeping or coming in, uh, you know, they're sleeping in cars, sleeping outside, or sometimes in the shelter system. Most of them have co-occurring mental illness uh, and have histories of trauma and untreated, un un uncared for trauma. We are, we are facing a toxic drug supply, which has driven, which has made the, driven the overdose um, crisis to, to the place that it is today, and has also made these kinds of conversations about the work we do, incredibly urgent. Um, we work in a, in, we operate in a space of racial uh, health disparities. And I think that that is in, that face that, is, that exists in substance use treatment as well. It's not just in primary care and medical services, uh, but um, in substance use treatment and mental health services as well. And finally, uh, our, our system of care, tr treating people, because for so many years, substance use, disorder was a criminalized health condition uh, in which people got to sent to prison instead of, or jails instead of to care for their health condition. We've operated in um, kind of an unholy, what I would call relationship uh, with the criminal justice system. And real, most problematically, we've become very reliant on coercion for care because so many of the people we've served were forced to come there. Obviously, this has had an incredibly horrific impact on black, indigenous, and other people of color. I'm quoting here the amazing scholar, Michelle Alexander, who wrote about mass incarceration of African Americans in this country. Nothing has contributed more to the systemic mass incarceration of people of color in the United States than the war on drugs. For some data, 
Nearly 80% of people incarcerated in federal prison on drug offenses are black or Latinx. And prosecutors are like, more likely to pursue a mandatory minimum sentence for black people than for white people charged with the same offense. It's still true. In terms of dis disparate impact, um, if you look at this, so here, the blue line here, the dark blue line, these are uh, overdose deaths in the US, between tw in increase in between 2015 and 2020. The dark blue line represents black African-American men. And you can see a dramatic increase amongst black African-American men from 2015 through 2020. Um, and this is on, on the, the other chart is specific to San Francisco. Um, so our system of care, to the degree that we have health disparities, it has led to increased mortality amongst African-Americans, in particular, black men. Similarly, access to um, opioid agonist treatment, or MAT, has been focused more on white folks than black folks. And you can see here, the chart on the left here, on the right, on the right, left, this one right here, okay? <laughs> uh, that um, chart shows access to methadone. Uh, methadone. Again, this is um, uh, MAT. So it, the chart on the left shows that in this case, the higher access is increased as we would expect uh, with, an, you know, with a greater focus on adding buprenorphine and MAT for people who have opioid use disorder, increase amongst white Americans, um, all others uh, has been pretty flat over that same period of time. So just to give the context in, the, in, in California, over 10,000 people died from a, uh, all drug overdoses from October 2020 to September 2021. Uh, and this is a, this picture is in San Francisco, and I talk about San Francisco because in San Francisco, more people died during the COVID shutdown period, shelter-in-place period. More people died of opioid overdoses, fentanyl in particular, but opioid drug overdoses than died from COVID in San Francisco. Um, so there was an increase, 70% increase in the annual rate of overdoses for, in 2019. Now this, I often use this particular fact. It's, you know, it, there might be more updated uh, information. This is from the 2017 survey and the National uh, Survey on Household Drug Use. Um, it might be much more updated information, but this has been persistent. Like the ratios have been pers pretty persistent for decades, okay? So what this shows is about 20.7 million people over here. It's, I think it's up to 22 million now. 20.7 million people in the U.S. had problematic drug and alcohol use in this period, according to the National uh, Survey on Household Drug Use. In that, of that group, the big circle, 2.5 million sought and received treatment. One million perceived the need for treatment, sought it, and couldn't access it. The rest of the circle are people who did not seek treatment, do not perceive a need for treatment. Now, those are the folks we have to care about. We have to care about everybody, but we really need to focus on that larger group because whether they sought treatment or not, they are at risk for adverse outcomes, including death from their drug use or alcohol use. Thinking about that has made health right really change the way we do our work. So a lot of but what I like to talk about is premature treatment departures. So the degree to which we get people in treatment, we have a high rate as a system of premature departures. I count a treatment, what I consider a premature departure is an unplanned departure. So what that means is a person was either, they walked out, they left against medical, there's lots of terms you might use for it, against medical advice, um, they were asked to leave for various reasons, um, behaviors, non-adherence, um, in some programs for drug use. So um, premature departures typically don't have a great outcome. We consider those poor outcomes as a provider. Increasingly, the risk of, of when people leave prematurely is there an increased risk, obviously, of arrest 
and now death. And so we really need to focus our work on premature departures. In substance use treatment, somewhere between 70, 50 to 70 percent of people leave treatment prematurely. They leave treatment prematurely. That's that average, the 50 percent average, is not terrible when you put it in comparison with the management of other chronic, kind of chronic health conditions like uh, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, right? This is about a 50 percent or so uh, uh, ability to put, get those conditions under control. Um, so we're about the same, but the risk for our folks now of not helping out, not kind of engaging them now because of the toxic drug supply is death. So what are we gonna do about it? So we start from a premise of engagement and connection. The most important thing that we need to do is to engage people quickly, right away, um, and truly operate from the principle of meeting people where they are and being client-centered. Now we all say in this room that we're client-centered, but it reminds me of like what, like my mom used to say to me, these Jewish parents in the Bronx, and my mom used to say, I just want you to be happy. And I'd be like, great. She's like, but happy my way. And so that's how we are with client-centered care. Like we are client-centered as long as the clients do what we think they should do. And then we're not, okay? So we think naturally people who are living on the streets and using drugs and homeless, don't have a house, in misery, of course they want treatment, but they may not. They may not want to stop using drugs. So it's our job to really, if you're client-centered, to figure out what it is they do want and how we can get them, get that for them, and then how to like meet them there and then bring them to the next place of health. So establishing and engaging and connection. Always maintain connection. Our goal is to try to keep that connection no matter what. Years ago, I found out that we were taking, this is years ago, but not like pre-cell phone years ago, like cell phone, years ago in cell phone years. Uh, years ago in cell phone years, residential treatment programs took cell phones from clients because we were afraid they were gonna make like drug drops or get distracted or whatever. We had all these th theories about it. So we took their cell phones. So when everybody had cell phones, Clients started refusing to they like leave treatment. They'd be like, I want to be able to talk to my kids. I need to be able to talk to my family. My mom needs to be able to reach me in case anything happens. So I'm not going to come to program because you're taking my cell phone. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe we should stop taking people's cell phones. And then let's take it one step further. Let's get their phone number. <laughs> if they leave, right? If they leave, we can call them. Hey, what happened? You know what? We love you. You're gone. We want you back. Whatever you need, tell us how you are. We're just calling to check on you. And so, lo and behold, we actually tracked the data here. We tracked the data and found out that, you know, a good 15% of clients got the call and came back. Like, people leave, they feel ashamed. And so, if you tell them, hey, we love you, come back, some will come back. So, so connection is so key. Harm reduction. I firmly believe that harm reduction does not sit opposed or outside of substance use treatment. We offer a continuum of services that starts with first do no harm and then meet people where they are and then let's think the next thing we can do to get people engaged into care. And so um, we often in this country, when we think about harm reduction, we very quickly go to you're enabling, you're encouraging, stop it, it's bad. And I, like, I urge all of us to like, like catch yourself thinking that and say instead, well, what, well, why do we do this? What would happen? Anybody who's worked with people on the streets who use drugs and who's seen people in misery continue to use drugs and so seen people come out of a prison sentence and overdose in 24 hours, die because they use drugs, knows that this conversation around enabling is highly problematic. Um, so 
when we think about harm reduction, we get these kind of bananas conversations sometimes, like we're enabling drug use. Like, oh, people are using drugs no matter what. They're going to prison, they use drugs in prison, they use drugs in jail, they use drugs in shelters on the streets, they're using drugs. So we need to figure out how to keep people alive and help them live with some dignity. So this is a cart we use in a harm reduction center that we operated for a little while. So what's funny about this picture is that this shows kind of standard harm reduction supplies, which you might think of as syringes. Of course, there's syringes here. But there's also pipes, straws, and what nobody sees because I had to hide it because the press, it's actually the press took the picture. I had to hide it. There was, oh my God, aluminum foil. Aluminum foil because people smoke drugs off aluminum foil. So you might recall that the, that the Biden administration said that they would support harm reduction uh, as an initiative and that meant they, they were going to fund syringe service programs. But then had to come out with a whole thing that said, but not pipes or foil because that's bad. And I'm like, okay, you'd rather people inject, like think about it before you say no. That's why I say, always stop and think. Before you say no, think about the alternative. So in San Francisco and in California, increasingly lots of people who use fentanyl and, uh, and meth, they smoke their drugs. So smoking, you could die. It doesn't stop you from dying. But what it does do is prevent potentially the transmission of bloodborne pathogens and also soft tissue infection, which can be quite severe. And so from a harm reduction perspective, people who smoke drugs, it's better, than people who, it's better for them than people who inject drugs. So let's facilitate that instead of saying, no, this is, we can't, the, 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 the administration doesn't allow us to give out pipes because we think that's bad, we, but, but you can inject. So anyway, just think, like I, 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 I challenge us to always question, but what if we did? Distribution of naloxone, um, like this has become very widespread. I'm so happy about this. I can't wait. I think it was San Diego that was thinking of putting it in vending machines. Um, San Francisco has some data. The Department of Public Health has some data that shows that the overdose deaths began to dip in San Francisco over the period of time, even though they were more than COVID, they began to dip, which is attributed to getting so much naloxone out on the street that people who use drugs are reversing other people's overdoses. So not our, so like we all carry Narcan, you all carry Narcan. Uh, it's so easy to use. And so the degree to which we get it out there and get it in the hands of people who use drugs or people who love people who use drugs is the degree that we save lives. Treatment on demand. Um, so what this, <coughs> what, what I'm referring to here is that we try to remove all barriers to access for people to access treatment. Now, one of the barriers typically is programs have a like Monday through Friday intake process. And so, but you know, we once one day I came to work and somebody graffitied on the window. It was a long weekend, it was Memorial Day weekend. And they said, but yeah, but what if I need help on what if I needed help this weekend? And I was like, yes. So we as a system, we like we operate on this kind of nine to five intake Monday through Friday, but people may like their moment may come on Saturday. And so how how can we be there for them to be there for the, for that moment? Right? Treatment, that means that for some people that's gonna be MAT only. For some people that's gonna be treatment without medication. Uh, but make sure that it's the right people uh, and the right again time. And then finally worker pay. I bring up the worker pay issue because um, sometimes you'll hear people call for more treatment beds. And currently we have a workforce crisis. You do, we all do in the state for behavioral health workers. And so treatment beds are simply pieces of furniture. If the rates that, they, that, they, um, that we're paying our workers is not attracting them into the field, okay? So again, just a piece of furniture, unless we have the right, you know, kind of the right compensation for people doing some of the most critical, we all worked through the pandemic, right? Didn't we all work through the pandemic? Like nobody's banging pots and pans for us at five, you know, every night like they were for health workers, like RNs and docs who worked in the hospitals. But our folks were there, they were working trash bags on and bandanas before we had PPE. Um, so um, I wanna like, urge everyone, I, hopefully we all accept the idea that um, opioid agonist treatment 
is a gold standard best practice for people with opioid use disorder. That means buprenorphine and methadone are the gold standard. Now, it doesn't mean that we have clients have to take it, but we should and must absolutely integrate that into our practices and make sure that our clients are aware of it. Make sure our clients are aware of the benefits and know that it's medicine and it's okay to take medicine. We don't tell people, listen, I have high, I, I, I have high cholesterol. I'm oversharing, forgive me. And uh, well, listen, I would, if I went running every day, my cholesterol would probably go down. But I don't run every day, okay? So I take medicine for it. And I keep taking the medicine and none of you are like going, she takes medicine for cholesterol. Like we don't shame me, you're not shaming me about it. But we somehow do that. We have an expectation that people should plan to come off their um, um, MAT at some point when in fact saving their lives. And it's a decision that they should make, that they should have the opportunity to make. Can, don't you like this? I loved putting a I loved putting urine on my on my slide. I was like, this I bet you I'm the only presenter today who has a slide of a pea cup. Okay? Uh, do y'all have the apple juice? But um anyway, <laughs> contingency management. Like, so exciting that California adopted this and incorporated this into its plan. Uh, there's a large, a large, I got, I got the heads up. I have to talk quickly. There's a large body of evidence that supports this, um, and uh, including a body of evidence that says just literally paying for uh, meth-free urine, people use less urine, not even with counseling. Our system is going to put it together with counseling, but it's pretty powerful body of evidence that supports this. And since we don't have an FDA approved medication for stimulant use disorder, this is really exciting. Um, so uh, health right, this is a this slide depicts a program we what, kind of a pilot program we did in San Francisco. It was called the Tenderloin Center, and um, we did it was a space for people who are homeless, experiencing homelessness, people who use drugs. Um, and it was a it was a drop-in center. It was open 12 hours a day, 16. I'm sorry, 16 hours a day. And um, in this space, we had an overdose prevention site. That meant that people were able to not only would give out harm reduction supplies, but people would use drugs, and we would be there to reverse overdoses for them. Um, and in that space, we reversed in a 11 month period. We reversed um, 333 overdoses. 333 lives were saved directly by our staff who intervened with Narcan and or oxygen. In fact, many of the overdoses were reversed with oxygen. Um, and more importantly, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, we built relationships with people. Now, and I, people who came there, they didn't come in there because they wanted to go into treatment. But over time, we built relationships with people where we got them into treatment when they wanted to. We got a bunch of people on methadone, a bunch of people on buprenorphine, got them over to detox, got them safe places to sleep. It was quite remarkable until it got shut down. Um, <laughs> um, quickly, I'll just tell you, this is a drug sobering center that we opened. And again, I want you to think about all of these things as like connection, catch people everywhere they are. And so the drug sobering center is a place for people who are in drug crisis where they can come, sleep, eat, pace, pack and unpack their stuff, play with Legos, whatever they need to do, take a shower. Um, there's nothing more restorative for a person who's been on a meth run and hasn't slept in five days than 10 hours of sleep in a shower and sandwich. And so from here, we can immediately take them over to detox if they want. If not, we can take them back to like wherever they hang out. We can take it over to, to like where their kind of the, the um, soup kitchen is, kind of connect them to the next service. Um, Resident, we, we call residential step down recovery bridge housing. So given that um, residents, most people come to us without housing and substance use treatment in residential services, residential uh, settings is capped at 90 days. Almost, you know, you come in within, without housing, you typically you don't have it at the end of 90 days. So this has been a godsend for people that we can keep people in housing until such time as they get housing while they continue their treatment in outpatient. Really, really rethought, think how we do treatment, right? It used to be longer residential stays and that the, like the heart of your treatment happened while you were in residential. We now think of it as like, that's the engagement piece. The heart of your treatment actually happens in outpatient because it's much longer length of stay. Uh, I'll talk briefly about this because it was kind of a, a wacky idea that turned out right. Um, 
when we expanded our clinic, we added a dental clinic um, because many people who use drugs have not had uh, dental care. They're missing teeth. And so it was really about dignity, getting a job and being with your family. Uh, we expanded the dental clinic because we thought it's also a great way to engage people who are not coming in for any other care. So if you think about it, people on the streets may not come in because of their hypertension. They're coming in for a substance use treatment. They're not coming in for mental health treatment. People will come in for a toothache. They will come in. You got a bad toothache, outreach worker says, I can get you to the dentist today. They're going to go. So we then got um, a federal grant to do screening, brief intervention, referral, and treatment, training the dental team. So the dental team is fully integrated with the behavioral health team and the medical team. So they can actually move people from dental into other services and care. And I couldn't believe HRSA funded it. Um, we're, as an organization, we advocate for safe supply. If people are dying from a toxic drug, if dying for a toxic drug supply, and we're struggling with what to do about uh, drug dealers, um, there's never been a positive impact that's been shown from kind of supply side, uh, incarcerating people who sell drugs. I understand why we do it, but it's not effective. And so some countries have, including uh, Canada, British Columbia, Switzerland, England has um, explored creating a safe supply of opioids that's similar to methadone, but closer, closer to the opioids that the uh, people in the streets are using and monitored in similar ways. Highly popular programs in those countries. Um, and finally, does, you know, does, does, in terms of the equity piece and cultural responsivity or programs, do our treatment, um, does it, first of all, we ask, do the treatment population match the community of people using drugs? The people in treatment look, at, look like the same people on the streets. Um, and then do our staff and leadership look similar? Like, is the, uh, do our, does our leadership and our organization reflect the people we serve? Um, and finally, uh, is justice and equity a part of our work? And I believe that it is, that we have to fight, that if we want to care for people, that we have to fight for dignity uh, for people who use drugs. We also have to fight unjust laws that overly incarcerate communities of color. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole bunch about Calain, but I can. But there's probably way better people in this room who are going to talk about Calain than me. Um, but obviously, some of the huge shifts in Calain have to do with moving from a service that we have to reconcile to cost every year to, to moving to a fee for service system. Um, and we're going to be moving to coding, CPT coding. That sounds like fun, right? Because uh, everybody went to graduate school and became an MSW because you wanted to code. And, uh, and the, the other reason why you went and did that was so that you can do documentation, right? Because that's the other thing you really were imagining your life was going to be, that you were going to be like spending a lot of time documenting treatment. Um, and so we're hoping that, that there's documentation reform. There's, there's been two steps forward and three steps back sometimes. And finally, we're anticipating value-based payments and incentives, we hope, for, for good performance. Uh, and I will stop there and take any questions. Well, you can't get them from stop to from I don't want it to stop. Like that's a that's a huge place to go. Can we get them from I don't want to to I will use less? Can we get them from I don't want to, but I want to, but I can get them to a different drug? Like for example, I have I'm giving a tour of one of our residential programs one time, and a client was like, "Hello, I'm a graduate of this program. I volunteer here." But I had like, I had like a politician with me. So, you know, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the client said to me, uh, I said, how you doing? It was nice to see you. He said, I am doing great. He said, I got my cannabis card with me. And I'm thinking, oh, God. And uh, <laughs> but I'm thinking, cool. But I'm also like, OK, I got a pretty conservative politician with me. And I'm like, he's like, uh, I got my cannabis card. And you know what? I don't use meth anymore. And I'm like, woohoo! Like, isn't that amazing? Dude is not using meth. 
He's smoking cannabis that's keeping him from using a much more dangerous drug that was a problem in his life. And so I think sometimes we got to figure out what they want. That's like the essence, the essence of motivational interviewing, right? Like I worked in prisons with people using drugs, and this guy was like, I don't care about drugs. I want to stop stealing cars. And I was like, okay, let's talk about how to help you stop. Because I keep going to prison because I'm stealing cars. So that was like his motivational interviewing goal for me and him was like, how do we get dude to stop stealing cars? Like first step number one, because going to prison was screwing up his life. Okay, I'm not doing supervised drug consumption in Orange County. Let me make that clear. In case you're thinking of like, holy crap, what do we get ourselves into? Uh, no, unless you ask us to, then we will. Um, <laughs> Um, no, we're really excited about it. I think one of the differences in Orange County is that the, there's a possibility in the program to integrate people who actually might be on insurance, have, have health insurance. And so um, that really is kind of every all are welcome. And I think that that's, um, it's not like we've never done that before we have, but we haven't done that um, like with a county partner, if you will. It was like a separate thing you did. And so to be able to integrate that, I think is kind of exciting. Um, yeah. Also, it's a nice facility. We're used to being an old, funky facility, so <laughs> I'm excited about that. It's no lie. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I really do think about harm reduction. I mean, like it applies to how we eat, and you know, in my mind, um, I would think that. Obviously, nicotine patches, nicotine gum, are harm reduction for nicotine use, um, and so is. I mean, there's. I know there's lots of issues with vaping, but it's still. I think there's less likely to be COPD and lung cancer from vaping for, for people who vape. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, because it's a, it's a fundamental um, part of the process in treatment, right? I, I went to a, years ago, I went to a conference. Uh, it was a NIDA conference on, um, like, treatment, to, uh, research to practice. And there was a presentation by, I think it was Bill Miller, about um, what was, like, effective intervention. So there was a, this was a period of time when there was a lot of, like, what are evidence-based practices. And uh, the, the most amazing, like I had an aha moment in this presentation, and it said that the, the biggest effect size came from the empathy of the counselor, right? The empathy of the counselor, the connection of the counselor. So that what, it, what he was basically saying, what, the re, what his research showed was that counselors who were good at connecting with clients had higher out, um, outperformed regardless of what intervention they were using, they outperformed other counselors, that the key was connection and empathy. And so once, it was like an aha moment. It's like, it was sort of like, this is, this is my, my walk, my takeaway is like, God, you could sit in a group and read the phone book if you're good at connecting, right? Um, that's extreme. But, um, 
but it really is. So the, if you really talk about like meeting, like talking to people, like the work that we did on the streets uh, in the overdose prevention site, sometimes we would just talk with people about like basketball, politics, because we work in an environment where we're only supposed to be talking about your problems. Oh, wait, I forgot your strengths. And so, but we never like have a human moment with you. We're just like, let's just talk about baseball. Uh, or let's talk about let's talk about the election, or let's talk about whatever you want. Let's talk about God. I mean, w part of connection is us having human moments with people, and giving space for that. And that was so was so powerful about the lowest threshold work that we do, is that that is so restorative to people. It's unbelievably potent. And you and if you haven't done it, you, like if you have an experience to do that, if you ever if you ever volunteered at like a, a needle exchange or syringe service prog program. Like those like human moments are so powerful that they speak for themselves. They speak for themselves. It makes people want to do their work differently. Um so uh, a good percentage of the people who work in the field, in the substance use, are people with lived experience. That's still true for us. The uh, majority of people who work in counselor roles are people with lived experience of substance use and or mental illness and or homelessness and or incarceration. By far, that's who comes into the field. And that's the largest body of our workforce. We have also uh, master's level clinicians, and then that's a smaller group of people with lived experience. Uh, for various reasons, but uh, it is, so there's lots of folks, so we value that, obviously. Um, the really important part is how I started today, it like, makes me an expert on me. The really important of education and coaching people with lived experience in the field is what worked for you doesn't work for everybody. What worked for you doesn't work for everybody. And so trying to help people remember that what worked for them, here's what I say, I believe that what worked for most of us with lived experience was a deep and like somebody cared about us. Like that was it. It is. We might have different memories of the experience, but you all have some. Those of us in the room who have lived experience have somebody. There was somebody at one point in treatment, or it was a pastor, or it was your probation officer who like saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself and believed in you and and like was just there for you. Those are the those we that is the thing that we all can do for somebody else, and that's how we build our lived experience from that. But again, the, the danger for all of us with lived experience is to say, um, "What works for me is going to work for everybody." Because I, when I was in treatment, you know, I looked around. This is what they said when I was in orientation. This is like a million years ago. I was in a therapeutic community. This is like a million years ago, and they said, "Like, look to the left of you. Look to the right of you. Only one of you is going to make it through this program." And I was like. What the hell? <laughs> I said, are we all supposed to make it? <laughs> and so, like, that's the thing. Lots of people leave treatment. Lots of people. So what worked for me, obviously, I made it through that program. Uh, what worked for me didn't work for 75% of the people who came in with me, right? And so uh, I can't just replicate what worked for me because it just, because it really only worked for me. Thank you. Thank you I'm so really much. Glad. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much, Vika. Jennifer? And now we're going to um, transition to our um, report outs by initiatives. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Thanks for being here and having lunch with us and um, giving giving your time to hear how we're doing with um, various activities. Uh, my name is Jennifer Breyer, and I am part of the MindOC Be Well team, and I have the privilege of overseeing our Substance Use Disorder Leadership Coalition. Um, and I'm here with Rhiannon Dosher. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And um, we have some exciting news to share. 
Um, we heard earlier this week that um, we received a third round of youth opioid response grant funding from the state. Um, this is part of the, thank you, thank you. Um, this is part of the state opioid response grants, um, and we've learned a lot over the last uh, three years doing this work, um, and we do it as a team. We do it as a collaborative set of partners. Um, MindOC is the lead agency, um, but we do this work with our clinical partner, KCS Health Center. They're an FQHC, um, and uh, MECA that is doing the outreach um, education and prevention work. And... I'm so happy that Vitka and her team are here um, and they're gonna bring their expertise um, and their vision to, to Orange County. Um, we did not coordinate on our slides. I just saw her slides just like you did, but um, I echo and just say ditto to everything she said. Um, the Youth Opioid Response Grant work that we're doing um, is, is more important, is, is you know, as important now as it has ever been. Um, I said this in December, for those of you who are here in December, um, this is really a call to action as community members and organizational partners. Um, right now, fentanyl overdose is the leading cause of death for Americans age 18 to 49. Um, it's, it's staggering what's happening out there and the arc of change that we have seen in leadership at the state level um, and at the local level around this issue. Um, but it really, it really does take all of us. So um, our most immediate goal right now in this work is to keep young people alive, um, reducing the number of opioid-related um, overdose deaths for youth age 12 to 24. So the state opioid response grants for youth span 12 to 24, which is kind of odd uh, um, age span because it includes transition age youth and, and adults um, over 18. Um, but really, we are here to come together and coordinate as partners to educate um, youth and their parents and families and schools and the medical and behavioral health providers um, around the deadly risks associated with opioid use. Um, and we're also here to make sure that people know where to get treatment when they need it and how to reverse an opioid um, overdose when it's happening. You guys um, at check-in probably saw we had naloxone kits at check-in. We um, expect all of those to be gone before the end of this meeting so that you can take them um, with you, um, with your colleagues, with your families, with your friends. But our long-term goal in this work is to create a coordinated, accessible system of substance use disorder treatment and support for all Orange County residents. And that's going to take some work, and it's going to take everyone in this room. So there are three major areas of our um, youth opioid response grant work. We have clinical services and recovery supports, and those clinical services are um, delivered by KCS Health Center. We have the community-based outreach education and training that MECA provides, and Rhiannon's going to talk about that. And then the third piece um, is really the cross-organizational systems change work that we're doing. And that's um, part of what I do every month um, is to lead a coalition of SUD um, leaders to talk about how to improve the work that we're doing. And this link at the bottom um, of this slide is really is the state... Um, YOR project descriptions where you'll see um, phase one and phase two of our work and hopefully phase three will be up there soon. So in terms of the cross-system coordination, um, like I said, we serve as the backbone organization and we assemble um, an amazing group of leaders and partners on a monthly basis um, to really talk about how to create um, uh, clinical and community linkages. We see this as an opportunity to bridge the prevention and education work that happens in the community with CBO partners and others with clinical service providers. Um, the other thing that we are trying to do is build capacity. Um, we there, the need for these services exceeds current capacity. There are limitations, as Vidka said, in terms of workforce, but also just network adequacy. And so um, there's a push to train more providers to get the, um, the skills um, and experience necessary to treat more patients. The other thing that we do in the monthly meeting is we identify challenges and opportunities that really need to be addressed at a system level. Um, some of the work that we're focused on is really um, supporting um, continuity of care during care transitions. Um, individuals seek treatment and receive treatment in places like hospitals, residential treatment centers like the Be Well Orange Campus, um, or in um, criminal justice settings, but then they go home. They go back to the community. Um, and right now we have a huge gap between capacity within some of these um, 
uh, centers of treatment and what is available on an outpatient basis. And so um, working on those linkages and making sure um, that we have strong referral pathways and follow-up procedures helps make sure that people maintain the continu continuity of care that we need. Um, the other thing that um, we, we talk about too is um, coordination between clinical and CBOs. Um, some of the barriers that also exist are around reimbursement, workforce, pharmacy barriers that are coming up. Um, like I said, we've learned a lot in this work. So you make certain steps and strides forward and then you learn new things about what's going on in the system that is creating access barriers. Um, but there are also opportunities. Um, we have an opportunity, as Vicka said, with CalAIM to support our Medicaid managed care plan in implementation of that program. So we, we talk about things like that too. Um, and then in terms of the clinical focus, our partner KCS provides the full range of SUD and behavioral health treatment. They have a dedicated MAT program that went 100% um, um, telemat during the pandemic. They have psychiatry services, counseling, harm reduction services. Um, in this grant, they're hoping to expand screening for ACEs um, and social determinants of health and provide um, wraparound supports through linkage to community-based providers. Um, and because it's a state grant, of course, they are collecting data. So they are collecting data on demographic and services to youth. Um, and that is something that we will be able to put together on a, on a dashboard and share um, on our website. I um, mean, one of the most exciting things that we're doing with this next grant, I'm going to let Rhiannon talk about, but we could not do this work um, in isolation. Uh, we need our clinical partners and we need our community-based partners to get the information um, that is needed out to community members um, who need it most. So Rhiannon, please share with the group what you're planning to do this next, next grant cycle. Thank you, and thanks again for having us here today. Um, we are really aiming our focus in three different areas as we do our outreach education and um, really work with the community to spread awareness around this crisis that we're in. Um, we've learned a lot over the last two rounds of funding. And one of the biggest takeaways that I've had from the last two rounds of funding is that youth want a place to belong and we need to have consistency. It's wonderful to be able to pick up that unit of Narcan at the Delhi Center, but where can you go if you need more? And how do we make that a consistent factor in the community? So with that said, we will be operationalizing a drop-in center that we're really excited about that will have a real slew of resources and services available at that center. We're really hoping for this center to be um, very youth-led um, and, and, and if nothing else, really um, center the youth voice in this space. We will be um, doing ongoing uh, Naloxone and Narcan distribution. We're really excited about being able to ensure that we're getting that out into our community on a regular basis. In addition to that, we will be mobilizing um, kind of an on-demand or a plug-and-play training. So it's available when you show up and you're available to do it right away. We envision having two different trainings, one training really focused to the younger population and one for maybe the support systems outside of that population, um, and having language capacity. We envision having the um, training for young people available in several languages, as well as the training for caretakers and support systems in even more languages. Um, we're hoping to have diversion activities, something else to do in that space, somewhere to come and feel connected, um, hang out with some friends, listen to some music, have a good time together. We will be doing assessment and treatment, um, uh, referrals and linkages to our clinical partner KCS and other folks in the community that have the capacity to serve that demographic. So we're excited to be able to kind of build out a continuum in this space as well. Um, we'll be doing education and training activities, including um, support groups, and these will vary based off the needs of the community, and we'll have ongoing access to materials. Help me again. <laughs> The second piece is we are going to be mobilizing pop-up centers. So everything that's available in the drop-in center would be available at the pop-up. And the goal there is to really expand our reach across Orange County and be from the most southern tip to most northern tip with um, kind of with the principle of being at other folks' tables. We really hope to get into communities and spaces where we can reach out to youth um, who've histor historically been left behind. So with that said, we're really hoping to use some of the MECA agencies as a home for our pop-up centers, but also get connected to other community-based organizations and agencies that serve young folks and their support systems. 
Um, we're hoping to build our relationship with the school systems. We've, um, in YOR2, we did quite a bit of work with the schools and we were able to um, really get connected and do some overdose prevention in schools. And um, we're really hoping to connect really more intentionally with justice-involved youth and bringing our pop-up center out to spaces where those individuals are at as well. I can do it this time, I think. <laughs> and finally, um, we are going to be putting out a surplus of um, materials. One really cool success story that we saw in YOR2 is some of the material that we had um, mobilized and deployed in the community. We ended up seeing in a lot of community spaces where it had a, you know, continuous life cycle and continued to be seen. So we're really excited about that and want to do more of that. And we are looking to do an event around Overdose Prevention Day. We would love community involvement um, and really making that come to life. So that's what we're doing in the space of outreach and education. Thank you. Great, thank you all. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Brianna and Jennifer? Okay, Dr. Kelly and Marshall. And Rosie? Oh, you guys are fast. Yeah, Hi, everyone. So um, good afternoon, I'm Ronnie Kelly, I'm the Behavioral Health Director for the county. And so we are really excited to share some information about some state funding that we've drawn down so that we can help build a second Be Well campus in Irvine. And so our staff worked really hard. Um, I wanna really acknowledge the work that they put in because the state doesn't make it easy to draw down state dollars. So we did this as well with our partners at MindOC and together we're able to come up with a really good application so for the Southern California region, there's a $450 million available for the whole state for each individual round of behavioral health infrastructure program dollars. These are dollars we can use to build a system, so to actually brick and mortar, actually build buildings so that we can have facilities. We can have places where we can actually treat people. And so the Southern region has $75 million available to it. This, the southern region includes six counties. Six counties sharing $75 million to build a facility. So the initial first round that we went for, uh, we asked for $10 million and we got that. And that is to fund a crisis stabilization unit, a voluntary crisis stabilization unit, so like psychiatric first aid or psychiatric uh, urgent care. And that will be um, at the Irvine campus. So we will have eight recliners there for adolescents so they can come there and get urgent care for a psychiatric crisis and then 16 recliners for adults so adults can come there and also get crisis care now a crisis stabilization unit is under 24 hours so it's just meant to be urgent care then that 10 million dollars will also build a sobering center where people can go if they're under the influence and they can then have access in that, you know, that brief moment of time when they might be open to having us offer ser services to them, they can then be offered those services in a very safe place. And so we'll have 12 um, beds, 12 spaces for that there. We applied then for the next round of dollars. Now remember, still 75 million, but we went for it and we asked for 60. We didn't get 60, but we got 27.6 million for the, ne the next round. And that is going to purchase uh, a, um, substance use disorder residential services. So a residential treatment facility that will, that will be able to treat 16 adolescents who, are, who identify as female, an additional 16 units for people who identify as male, and then 24 residential beds for perinatal, so women who are pregnant and parenting so they can also take their children up to the age of 10 into services with them. We know the number one reason women don't go into treatment is they don't wanna lose their kids. 
this allows them to take their kids and then we can intervene so that the kids have uh, coping skills and management skills. We teach mom parenting skills. Most of us didn't learn that, right? We learned it on the job. So we want to give them every opportunity so that they can have what many of us have, which is um, clean and sober life with our children. So that's super exciting. And then we are, uh, there's a couple more rounds coming. Unfortunately, the governor's office, the governor's budget has kicked the, one of the next rounds a whole year. So we've been lobbying. I was lobbying yesterday in Sacramento to try and get those dollars to may, be made available to us now. We need them. But so we brought the dollars down. So now what we have to do is build. And so our partners here are going to talk a little bit about what the site looks like. But I really did want to stress that this is a partnership in the County of Orange between county government and we are the ones who provide the public behavioral health services in the county. And then my, uh, MindOC, who is our public-private partnership, bringing in, in innovative ideas, looking at things a little differently so we can serve everybody in the community who wants to be served. So, Marshall? Thanks, Shawnee. Thank you. I was waiting for the, the slides to trip over, but I think we're responsible for that. So hold on a sec. Oh, good. Yeah. Please hold. Is that it? Be well, Irvine. Okay. Sorry, we didn't have the right slides up for Ronnie, and she's called to a, another presentation. And so put your roller skates on, Ronnie. Good luck. Um, Thank you guys, uh, glad to be here. Um, I'm Marshall Moncrief and this is Rosie Zoll. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, add some context to what Ronnie was talking about with respect to the dollars. And so um, you're aware of uh, the Be Well campus in Orange and there's gonna be an update on that here in a minute. Um, we're going out of order here just as people are getting called to, to different uh, time demands. And so thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, but uh, the, some of the ideas, um, just to, to marry some things up here, um, I'm uh, about to get to know Vitka for the first time, but um, really, really glad that you're here with us in Orange County and uh, appreciate everything that you said um, about this community and how we need to be available to community um, and provide the care that's, uh, that's so desperately needed and deserved. And Vitka, you made a comment on a kind of a bed is just a bed, a piece of furniture unless um, unless there's welcoming care to bring people in and get them in. And the same could be said um, about facilities. And so uh, the Be Well uh, building in Orange and what we're about to show you in Irvine, um, they're, they're beautiful environments, but they sit and will be nothing more than a pretty building um, without being infused with um, the people and the community uh, that's reaching out to one another to be available to care for one another. And so these campuses end up serving uh, for uh, more than just uh, facilitating treatment. They've become actually center points where we can gather together and work together in ways that um, might have been more difficult previously. Collaborations become possible in new ways. And so as we share with you this information around the Irvine campus, we're really pleased um, like Ronnie said, to have, have come in public-private partnership in a, in a compelling way to draw down new dollars into Orange County and expand yeah. care. We're really proud of the design that Rosie's going to walk you through. But the most exciting thing about it is it is expands the canvas with which we can work together to create new possibilities of care and new connections with each other. And that's what these facilities represent. That's what we're so proud about. So... Um, in, uh, in the early blueprint, many of you uh, in the room were, were here to help uh, create that blueprint. Um, there was a, a result area where we were thinking with the end in mind. So if we were to advance a world-class system of, of mental health and substance use treatment for everyone in Orange County, by, with, and through the community of Orange County, um, what, would we, what would we do? What would we accomplish to move that needle? And, um, and establishing these facilities that I'm describing became a key result, that we would have these facilities that were not just um, terrific uh, in, in their dignity, care, and compassion, but were um, collaboration centers for us to come together as community. And so this next one in Irvine, um, 
it, it is really our next step, providing choice, connection, and community. And so fully expressed, we want this, uh, this campus to be available for the entire Orange County community, regardless of your economic status, your payer type, um, different cultural expressions that may resonate with you or, or be a need for treatment to be meaningful. And so uh, there's a big aspiration here. Some of the underlying um, ideas of the campus, and this is a picture of what we're envisioning. And then Rosie will talk to you about how we're kind of plotting the space um, and planning on advancing the construction here coming soon. But some, some of the principles in, uh, in creating this um, are really centered around this commitment uh, to serve everybody regardless of, of their payer type or, or cultural background or socioeconomic status. A place that provides hope and trust, but also destigmatizing. And so in Vitka's, in Vitka's conversation with us, we had lots of opportunities to see all of the ways that barriers manifest uh, to getting care and the way in which stigma needs to be broken down. And one of the ways that we can start to break down stigma is creating spaces, care spaces and facilities that emphasize dignity, respect, um, trust. And this space is, is aspiring to accomplish that. We also want this to support integrated care. I loved uh, Vika's um, description of the integrated primary care and dental care and actually jujitsu flipping the front door to make dental care the entryway into substance use treatment, it's brilliant and makes all the sense in the world, right? And so if we can leverage this campus and the, the smart co-location of different programs and services, how can we flip that script in the same way and pro provide access um, in, in unique creative ways? Collaboration of the public partners, that's what I was talking about before. And um, a real shout out to the county, um, this is a partnership. And this wouldn't be happening without the county's leadership. There's 20 plus acres of land in Irvine, California that could be used for a whole lot of things. And it's going to be used for world-class mental health and substance use care. And that wouldn't be possible without the county donating the property. And so because there's that much space, we have an opportunity to create outdoor spaces that are as intentional and therapeutic as the indoor spaces. And so it gets to be really exciting in that way. Um, and so we're, we're, we're really looking forward to it. You'll notice um, in this first picture that, um, that the facility is all single story and a whole lot of glass and natural light. And so again, because there's space to kind of spread out and breathe, um, the design, which was informed by community and probably I don't know how many dozens of meetings Rosie's facilitated, that these wanna be um, intimate and welcoming and not big monolithic buildings that, that can intimidate, but something that feels a little more like home and more, more residential and inviting. And so the whole design concept uh, is centered around that. So I wanna hand it to Rosie because she's really sort of the brilliant brain behind blocking this space. So when you're given 20 acres and told, hey, yeah, you can run far and fast and create a world-class center for, for mental health and substance use, um, it's exciting and a little overwhelming. Like what do you do with that blank canvas and how do you position things? So there's been dozens and dozens of community conversations with us and the county and Cal Optima and a thousand health systems and now a, a, a broadening scope of community members uh, to start to inform that. So Rosie, I'm gonna hand it to you and if you could sort of talk through how we're breaking up the space um, and how we're gonna approach this from a construction perspective, that'd be great. All right, it's great to see everybody. We talked a little bit back in December, um, so it's nice to be back here and share a little bit more detail with everyone. This, this is the 22 acres that Marshall was referring to, and we're really thinking about this space across the full continuum. If you think about sort of the far left as sort of prevention and getting in early, moving into treatment all the way to sort of urgent support, trying to cover this whole continuum of services across the campus. Where the left-hand side of the campus is intended to be all about community, welcoming community in, opportunities for education and classrooms, peer support. As we sort of shift over to the right side of the campus, we get into more sort of treatment opportunities, both residential and outpatient, and then on the far left, more of that urgent sort of crisis care. 
uh, we are tackling this in phases. And so what we're focused on right now is the blue outline area one, um, but very quickly we're going to move into area two because of what Dr. Kelly shared, the opportunity of dollars coming in through the state that we can get started here on area two, which will be entirely focused on children, adolescents, and families. Just a quick schedule here for area one. So we've actually started um, demolition and abatement efforts. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the site, it's an old um, El Toro military base. So there's actually a lot of deep history there. Um, we've been able to take some beautiful um, photographs actually of the site to sort of help tell the story of this kind of transformation of this site. And we're now in there. I'll show you a few pictures in a moment of um, the sort of active construction site and it's really happening. So we'll be doing that for about six months and then we'll start actual construction work for area one, uh, looking to be open towards the end of 2024. Uh, here's a few pictures. Got Be Well Blue up there on all <laughs> construction barriers. Um, you can start to see lots of very, very careful work happening on the site um, to start to get it ready for construction. And then just a little preview, um, like I said, as Dr. Kelly was mentioning, we're starting to um, start efforts around area two and, and really trying to think about how this could be something really special in Orange County that's really custom sort of specialized for that youth um, and family population also supporting mothers and children. So I'm really excited to start to see that planning work come to life here in the next few months. Rosie, let me make a comment too. So, so Dr. Kelly it had to scoot out faster than she was expecting and we really should have had this slide up for her um, when, when she was talking. And so when she was mentioning um, kind of this excitement about being able to draw down state dollars, um, it's to activate this. And so it's to be able to build this. And um, another reference to a Vitka comment when you were saying, I don't remember which part of your program uh, you had put together. Maybe it was the um, clean supply or something and HRSA funded it. There was something where you were sort of surprised. And can you believe HRSA funded it? The enthusiasm about that is, for those of us boots on the ground in the trenches, and many of you are, you know how strained these things are and how utterly critical it is to, to get financial support, to support doing the right thing for community, and it's a constant struggle. And so one of the things that's coming out of this Be Well collaboration that is all of us and the public and the private and the everybody in the room is it's drawing attention to state and federal leaders and getting attention to draw down state and federal dollars that would have been more challenging yesterday than it is today, given this relationship. And it's to do stuff like that. Um, and that that's the importance of it. And that's the value of it. Um, hey, Rosie, can we go back to, to, to this real quick? Wait, did we cover that one? Oh, I'm going, I'm going forward. Yeah. Another quick comment. Um, Rosie was saying that, that, that there's a lot of care being given to this. These are all World War II Marine Corps built um, giant industrial can't blow them out of the ground buildings. And so um, it, it really is a pretty big um, technical undertaking um, to pull these things down thoughtfully and create a new pad. Um, that, that's going to be available like a new canvas for these buildings. And Rosie's working in really close collaboration with the Irvine community and Second Harvest Food Bank, who's right next door, um, to make sure that we're great neighbors with, with all of that. Um, so I just wanted to, to call that out. And the last thing to add to, and then I'm going to exit, is one more reference to, um, to Ronnie's comment on the bee chip that there's been B-CHIP state dollars pulled down for area one, which is under construction now. And then what Rosie was highlighting is in that middle area too. And so both things have received that type of funding and we're gonna keep at it um, and try to get as much uh, federal and state support as we can to pull this off. I think that's it, right? Okay, thanks Rosie.
Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Chi, um, and I'm excited to be here today. First of all, Vitka, we are so looking forward to having you and your phenomenal team at the Orange County campus. So we are grateful, and the gratitude just extends. They are amazing to work with. So, so excited. Um, the MSA launched uh, at the Orange campus on January 1st of 2023. It doesn't seem so long ago, but it kind of feels long ago <laughs> as I look at Ian and the team over there. Um, we are working to revitalize and renew our outreaches to engage our referral sources um, within the Orange County communities. We're working very closely with our hospital partners, our local law enforcement, um, police departments to to talk with them on navigation to campus um, and to educate folks on our services. So we've launched a whole full um, full court press, if you will, um, to be able to, since we're getting into March Madness, um, to be able to get into um, <laughs> to, to all of these areas, um, to be able to kind of say, yep, we're here, we're still here, we're working, we're here every day, we're open, we're available. So we are working incredibly collaboratively with our HCA partners um, with the county and our provider to continually improve the services that we are providing to the residents of Orange County. And we are very grateful for the collaboration and partnership and um, level of detail that you've all had to go through to actually tell us what it is that you do all of the time and that we have gratefully tried to hopefully accept all of that. So we are really pleased with the, with how it's launched so far to date. And Nicole is gonna be able to show you all some great slides with some data about what's happened in the campus um, since January. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi everyone. Uh, so I get the pleasure of um, giving a little uh, snippet of some data um, about the services that are happening at uh, the BWO campus, Orange. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, the MSA just uh, fully went into, um, into uh, focus on January 1st. Um, the services have continued to be provided. So um, just to put it in context, um, we have had services active since January of last year. However, um, this is a new role that MindOC is play playing as of January 1st. So we have the, um, the great uh, ability to share more information with um, our BeWell community. So the first slide here is um, representing our care navigation team. This is actually um, not um, an Exodus um, function, but it's actually um, one of our Be Well, um, um, Be well teams. So they're staffed by Be Well staff, um, and they are integrated into um, the services at the campus. Um, they provide uh, resources and supports to our clients and family, especially linkage. And so um, going back to what Vika presented about the access to care, um, we see the, ca the care navigation team as someone who is instrumental in making sure that if someone does uh, either need access to the campus or they're just inquiring about what type of services are available, our care navigation team can help link them with that. Um, and then also be very supportive throughout um, the process of care when we do have family members that are, um, or family and clients actually, uh, clients that are receiving services. Um, so with our care navigation uh, team, they started in April, and this is information that we have collected from April to February of this year. Uh, the total calls that they've fielded so far have been 2,502, um, and the resource requests that they have fulfilled are 1,140. Um, of the referrals to care, there were 1,002 uh, to crisis services, which is um, incredible for you know a team that's technically answering the you know front door, the phone calls um, from our community and our partners, and then 360 to residential care. So the Sobering Center is operated by Exodus. They're our partner in care at the Bewell campus. The Sobering Center is a first of its kind in Orange County. Um, and Exodus just started uh, providing those services as of January 1st. Well, actually, I'm sorry, let me take that back, as of September. But under our new role with the MSA, we are able to now share some of that information on the services they've provided. 
Here we have a representation of admissions for January and February. Um, I will just highlight here that February was a short month and typically in January and February, because of the weather and just um, the fact that it's winter time, um, there might be um, you know, longer instances of people with their family over the holidays. Um, we tend to see less um, people coming into Subbrain Center during those times. Um, the average daily census was 3.4 for both months, and that's taken into consideration the amount of days in the month. Um, and then the average length of stay is 14.6 um, hours, and that was um, for January and 16.4 for February. Uh, I'd like to highlight a little bit about the, um, the pair uh, types um, that, are, that we're seeing um, in our clients. Um, the Be Well campus is you know, providing care to anyone, regardless of their payer status, their socioeconomic status. And um, to highlight that, we, um, we are tracking the, um, the payer source for all of our clients, whether they utilize that or not. Um, so for um, Sobering Center, we had uh, the majority were Medi-Cal clients, um, but we are seeing an uptick in um, our private insurance. And as we um, start to contract with more of our commercial payers, um, we'll see an uptick in that over time. The crisis stabilization unit, so the CSU um, operates for adults and then separately for adolescents. So I have two slides here for, um, the, for those units. For a crisis stabilization unit, uh, total admits for January were 218 and then February 208. Um, I'll skip to the average length of stay. So we're seeing about a 30, 30 plus um, average length of stay. Typically on the crisis stabilization units, um, it's a 23 hour um, service. So we're noting again, looking at the fact that we're in the colder months and so there are other um, um, factors that are coming into um, the, the stay. For our um, payer types, um, we do note that there is um, you know, a more substantial amount of private insurance. That's due to the type of services that are being provided. And uh, I'll go to the adolescents. So with adolescents, um, we have, uh, it's a smaller population um, being served. There's eight beds as opposed to um, the 16 on the um, adult unit. And um, with that, um, the total admits for January were 55 and February were 67. Um, we have an average length of stay um, between about 26 hours. Um, we're noting uh, that with the average length of stay, um, the adolescents are also, there's other um, layers of involvement because the, um, there's factors with parents and school, et cetera. Um, for the payer makeup, we are also um, seeing the Medi-Cal population is the majority of our clients at this time, um, but we do have a pretty good representation of our private insurance um, clients. For crisis residential program, um, that's a longer uh, term service. Um, in January, oh, I'll, um, let me take it back. Um, so uh, with respect to the amount of beds, um, it's a 16 bed. And so um, that's actually, yeah, 16 beds. I'm sorry, 15 beds. Um, and so with the 15 beds, um, we saw total admits were 18 in January. And then uh, February, we had 19 admits. Um, for average length of stay, we're um, in between about uh, you know, 13, uh, 13 days um, between the two months. And then um, with respect to our um, payer status, um, majority is Medi-Cal, um, but we are seeing um, uh, some uh, private insurance starting to trickle in. And that's also due to um, the new contracts that we have in place with commercial payers. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions or... Okay. All right. So I'll just make one last comment with respect to the data. So this is a very um, short representation of services. Um, like I said, we just started um, really being able to share um, this data um, as of January. So it's a two month representation. Um, we'll be able to share uh, a much better representation in the next quarter at our next coalition meeting. Um, and so we'll, we'll look forward to sharing that with you. And I see there's a question from Vitka. <laughs> Oops. 
Let me go back. Your resp um, it, is that first? So, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, with respect to the insurance, um, there's two twofold. So, yes, you're right in the fact that it is a short-term stay. Um, what the staff is um, instructed to do is to try to capture that information from the clients. So um, with the general intake information, they're able to then follow through and see whether they did in fact have Medi-Cal or, or insurance. Um, we are receiving the information uh, for, like our data is uh, a month um, prior. So we do have some time to be able to research that and whether they have. Um, I think it's the type of clientele too. So with the Sobrain Center, um, we have the, you know, the factor that they are um, potentially the clients, once they leave, we cannot um, essentially contact them um, as often or as, um, um, you know, as best as, as we can. Um, with the other CSU and the other um, programs, there are, um, you know, better opportunity to uh, follow back with the clients. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, it is a little, a little bit longer term care. And so, yes, we are able to secure that insurance information. Sure, no problem. Hi, everyone. Ian Kemmer. Uh, just to answer a little bit more about that. Yes, the Sobering Center does take folks with uh, with no insurance, and we have been for a long time. And so I think that that's, um, that's like the like the, what they're talking about here is just that short period of time. But for the, the history of the Sobering Center, we've done that. And currently, we contract to make sure that we can pay for that. The rest of the services are paid through their grant with Calipto and through community supports. So, sure. All right. Any other questions? Another one in the middle. Hold on. Hang on. Yes, they are. What was the question? Oh, are the police aware of this? Yes. There's that's part of the um, outreach that Rebecca was describing. The active outreach to all the police departments and also to hospitals. Okay. Thanks. There you go. Sorry, did you see these up and down? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Hello. I'm Dr. Dave Cheneau. I'm from the Department of Social Work at Cal State Fullerton. And as somebody pointed out earlier, uh, happy Social Work Month. Um, <laughs> I'm here to tell you about three events. One is actually past, but I want to show you this because two of your coalition partners spoke to 150 of our faculty and students, uh, students who are future healthcare, behavioral health and substance abuse providers. And uh, this was just last Friday, there were 150 of them there. Um, we were delighted to have Dr. Heather Hutzi. I think she's here somewhere. Um, and. Uh, uh, we appreciated uh, uh, her presentation and Dr. Ronnie Kelly, who was up on stage just a bit ago. They were great. The students were very responsive, and uh, it was a great presentation. Um, I, I um, give that as an example of the Department of Social Work uh, strengthening our ties with the community of healthcare and public and and uh, behavioral health providers. Uh, this is something we are working at. And our next, my next announcement, the next event, um, definitely uh, demonstrates this as well. We have partnered with Be Well in sponsoring an event. Um, this year, last year we had William Miller speak. Some of you may have attended that um, on motivational interviewing. And this year we wanted to focus on trauma. 
And we thought, who better than probably the most famous name in trauma, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. Um, and Be Well has partnered with this. Marshall and his team have been great to work with on this. This has taken an enormous amount of planning and time to, to pull this off, but we um, do have Dr. Bessel van der Kolk speaking. He's gonna give a four hour training on April 21st on trauma research and, um, and practice in working with trauma. Uh, probably none of your clients have experienced trauma, right? That's a very small proportion. Um, yeah, uh, I used to be a clinician for a long time, but both in, uh, in child welfare and then in public mental health and uh, I would say about 100% of my clients had experienced a lot of trauma. So um, there is a QR code on your agenda for this event. And I will tell you, this is a live webinar event and he will have Q&A periods. I will tell you, I looked about an hour ago and there were 910 people signed up for this already. So, uh, and that's, we haven't even fully disseminated um, the information about this event. So um, you might want to get on it if you want to register and you do need to be registered to be uh, a part of the event. And as I said, it's a live webinars and you will have a, a Q and A periods. So welcome to all of you. This is a way to express um, with Be Well, our appreciation for all of the health, uh, behavioral health, substance abuse services providers in Orange County. It's specifically for you and the people in your organizations who deliver ser services, <coughs> excuse me, to the people in Orange County. And finally, the last event, I'm, I'm trying to go fast. Um, this is a brand new program. I'm the director of this program and it's called the Health Education Pathways Program. Um, we've been working with students for quite a while now at Cal State Fullerton, both undergrad and graduate students. And we are convinced that many of them have no idea the breadth or variety of professions they can go into in healthcare, behavioral health. They know doc, physicians and nurses, and that's it. And even within nursing, um, they have no idea the wide range of fields that nurses practice in, um, and much less all the other uh, jobs that are, are um, available in health and behavioral health. So the idea in this program is we want to um, help you build a future workforce, basically. Uh, we are partnering with two high school districts, uh, Cypress Community College as well, and of course, Cal State Fullerton. This, this event is gonna be on our campus. Uh, we welcome organizations to come and represent what kind of jobs there are out there. Our students need to be made aware the variety, the types of jobs uh, that they can consider. And we will also have representatives from various majors, uh, departments at CSUF that educate students for those jobs. Okay, that's just, is <laughs> try to make it fast. Well done. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheneau. And uh, by the time this room is done, we'll be over a thousand registrants, I think, right? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, nobody, we have to close the doors. Nobody can leave. You're all captive. Um, I know it's, it's been long, but um, now you get to actually uh, participate. I know we've, there's been a little bit of a fire hose, um, but part of what we wanted to do today was to use this as an opportunity to get new feedback on our behavioral health systems transformation work. Uh, many of you may know that we, with the county, have been working on an innovations grant. 
um, that is focused around behavioral health systems transformation, improving the be behavioral health system. And a large part of this, um, this work has been focusing on recognizing that there are challenges in Orange County, just like there are challenges in California. Um, but we started with, with the um, recognition that there's fragmentation across the sectors. Sectors don't work together. They're doing you know, great work within their sectors. We always say the um, cylinders of excellence, that sort of thing. But the idea is to actually get um, better alignment and coordination and even integration across the sectors to support the health and behavioral health needs of the Orange County population. Um, we also had the recognition that insurance networks do not support person-centered access and service delivery. And so one of the major goals of behavioral health systems transformation is to start addressing that. It's to understand it, understand the root causes, and then build, um, build strategies to address that. The third was the inadequate knowledge of existing resources, services, and benefits, and how to navigate them. So that basically is a long way of saying people don't know how to get the services that they need at the right place at the right time. And so part of what we've been working on through this, this work is to understand that better too and to understand where, where the systems break down and think about how we can incentivize um, change and transformation. And then finally, um, you know, the available care is not delivered optimally. And what that means is that there, in, there are enormous resources in Orange County. There are amazing providers but they're, um, and, and programs, but they're not well coordinated. They're not well aligned. And so they're not really creating a system. So part of what, what this work is trying to do is to, to better understand how we can move toward a, a stronger system of care. And you all know the Be Well logo. And really what this is coming from is recognizing that, you know, we, this is our current system of fragmentation and we want to move into that integrated system where we're um, sharing care and coordinating care and actually bra braiding and blending funding. And I'm going through this quickly because I want you all to get to, to work. Um, so the Behavioral Health Systems Transformation Project really has two buckets of, of um, work that we've been doing. And we started this work in, was it 2019? Yeah, 2019. So um, we did have a pandemic in between so, um, but we still were able to, um, to make a lot of accomplishment, <clears throat> or make a lot of progress in the work and accomplish a lot. Um, so the two buckets are community planning and input. And we did that throughout the, the pandemic virtually, but prior to the pandemic hitting, we actually had community meetings like this, where we were able to get input from folks. We also did a lot of work around um, assessing the, the system and the current capacity and then um, you know, thinking about how you can build a better system and think about how to better design the financial aspects of the system. So back in 2020, before the pandemic hit, I think this was February, maybe, March-ish, well, pandemic hit in, in February. Did, oh, well, we also did it in person, but anyway. Um, so we asked, asked um, two questions. What do you think are the top five areas that should be measured to know that you and your family members are getting high quality behavioral health care? And as you can see, um, a lot of this has to do with, with um, access. So it's easy to find a provider, get an appointment. That 80% said that that was the top, um, one of the top five. Improved sense of health, or mental health and physical. Improved social and emotional well-being making measurable improvement toward um, personal goals, et cetera, all the way down. And I'm sharing these for, with you so that you can get inspired. These are just, these are to kind of prompt you. Um, the next question was, what do you think are the top five areas that should be measured to know that Orange County's behavioral health care system is delivering high quality care for the community? And here we had, again, access. Clients increasingly able to, to easily find providers, get appointments and be seen for care. And then improving coordination across providers. So understanding the fragmentation piece, decreasing avoidable psychiatric med and medical hospitalizations, et cetera. So what we are asking you all today is to kind of keep some of these, um, these things in mind, but we want to do a check-in. Um, we are now four years into the grant. 
we have learned a lot. We have um, one of the one of the deliverables that the county has for this grant is related to um, how do you build a better contract? How do you think about contracting differently with providers to incentivize outcomes? You know, really pay for performance. And so we've been working working on that, but we want to make sure that the priorities of the community are reflected in what we're saying people should get paid for. So that's that's really the the big question today. So on your tables, and John, do you have something that you can show, please? There is a piece of paper, or maybe a couple. Do we have a couple worksheets for people, or is yeah? Okay, so you have a worksheet on your table. And first I wanna ask you to identify somebody, somebody in your group who is a good note taker, somebody who can actually take notes and take them accurately and legibly. And then the second thing is, the second thing is to take a moment to review. If you, can, if you can hear my voice, raise your hand. If you can hear my voice, raise your hand. Okay, the second is take a moment to review the following questions. So how would you know if you or your family members are getting high quality behavioral health care? And then the second one is how would you know if Orange County's behavioral health service continuum is delivering high quality care for the community? And if you could, um, at your table, contemplate these questions and then provide some, some responses because we'd like to harvest your ideas again. We wanna make sure that what we learned in 2020 is still a priority for you. And we wanna be able to incorporate that into our work. So I'm gonna ask that you do this for, I don't know, the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, and then we will be gathering the sheets of paper before you leave because we need, to, um, we need to be able to reflect that back. So thank you and have a good conversation.